Welcome everyone. As people start trickling in, I thought I'd just provide a little bit of a background to this gathering. Our co-hosts, the Hong Kong Jockey Club, convene uh, Philanthropies for Better Cities in Hong Kong every two years. It is one of the largest philanthropic conferences in Asia, and it's a, it's a great meeting place for philanthropies from all corners of the world to come together. Uh, one of the emphasis, in fact, is to get really proper diversity of geographic spread um, from the world of philanthropy. Now, obviously, we know the challenges uh, from uh, facing us in this pandemic, and we couldn't bring people together physically. So instead, we're uh, hosting a, a series of conversations to carry forward the spirit of that conference. Uh, we held our first one in April, and today we're going to engage on our second conversation. Uh, again, for philanthropies with only philanthropies in the room. So I hope you look forward to it. Now, I don't know what we thought where we would be eight to nine months later. I certainly doubt we thought we'd be where we are. Uh, but here we are, right? So COVID-19 is far from over. We remain in the trenches. Uh, yet there is uh, obviously light at the end of the tunnel uh, in terms of uh, both the response and uh, vaccines and so forth. So we are today going to look ahead to the ways this pandemic will leave a lasting imprint on our shared future. Uh, and it is, not lost, uh, it is not lost on us that the post-COVID-19 equilibrium is not necessarily going to be more equitable. There's a lot of conversation about Build Back Better, but that is, a, that is a concerted effort. And in fact, there are multiple things on our horizon that could suggest that things go the other way. And in fact, what the pandemic has done is expose inequities. And in fact, some of the things that are helping drive certain outcomes digitization, for example, work from home, many of these trends could actually further widen inequalities as well. So there's a real role for philanthropy to think about how it can push for a more just outcome. So with that in mind, we've organized today's dialogue. Uh, this dialogue is uh, you know, a fantastic opportunity for philanthropies. And you know, we've got about 160 different organizations who have registered uh, and the leadership of those organizations with us today, which is a pretty unique opportunity, an invite-only opportunity for philanthropies to discuss amongst themselves. So we're all amongst friends and I have asked the panelists to therefore uh, be bold in what they have to say, uh, as if they were with family members. And please ask tough questions if need be. Um, but we have a fantastic audience uh, and uh, it's from across the globe. And I think what we will discuss is three things. What are the new priorities that have emerged during COVID-19 that uh, philanthropies are well-placed to tackle? What are those new things where right now we have the opportunity to shift the kind of equilibrium the world is gonna settle into uh, in the future? At the same time, what are the long-standing challenges that we risk ignoring? We know that there's been big pivots. Uh, we know that there's been challenges in fundraising. What are those really critical ones where where that really there's a huge risk that they're super underfunded and there's going to be disasters in the future. And then finally, we're going to discuss a little bit more uh, at an org level, something self-reflective around what has this crisis actually taught us about philanthropies themselves, right? Do, do we need to think about operating differently? Did we collaborate as much as we said we would? Uh, was the capital as flexible? Or we might in our own bureaucracy, did we get it out fast enough? So I think really understanding the experiences of uh, of the panelists uh, and really the audience more broadly around that question. So as I said, we'll start the discussion firstly thinking about what are the new priority agendas? What's new and emerging? And I'm gonna ask uh, Elizabeth to kick us off and I'll introduce folks as we go along uh, lightly. So we uh, keep the conversation moving. Uh, Elizabeth heads the UN Foundation, which has done a stellar job of quickly deploying money to critical global institutions, especially WHO. So just to give you a flavor, uh, they were able to mobilize over half a million, I think 650,000 donors from 190 countries so far to generate about $238 million very quickly for the crisis of which the vast majority has been dispersed to the WHO and other partners for pandemic response. Uh, so phenomenal, phenomenal job Elizabeth. Um, and uh, I know that given your vantage point, you're part of uh, a lot of these global conversations, in your view, what are the new agendas that philanthropies should be taking up? What is it that this pandemic has revealed or new trends that this has accelerated that means that philanthropies need to be involved in sort of helping set what the new equilibrium could be? 
Well, thank you so much, Gaurav, um, and thank you to HKJC and all colleagues for hosting this session. It does feel like only yesterday that we all met in April and the world has uh, really been upended. So this is just such a critically important time to be having this discussion and very excited for the conversation. Um, I think, do think this is a moment of real challenge and opportunity for philanthropy to do more of what it does best to change where it needs to, which I know we're going to talk about later in the conversation, and to be even more engaged and visibly engaged in our communities and in public life, which I know is also something we'll come to. So you asked about priorities, um, and they are fast and furious, but I would point to three areas where I think there is real both urgency and opportunity for new ambition um, from philanthropies. Um, first, we do need to double down on our previous investments. And that's maybe not as new as it sounds, but I think it's critical to keep it very high on our agenda. You know, the millions of people who are at new risk of falling back into extreme poverty, the 80 million kids who are at risk of not getting immunizations for preventable diseases like measles, the huge setbacks in gender equality, you know, making sure that we don't lose further ground, but then we get not only back on course, but back on course with ambition in some of those critical areas does need to be part of our new effort, not only a uh, something that we see as part of our past. And that very much needs to include rebalancing around some major unmet needs in those areas. So just as an example, and I saw it on the word cloud as well, you know, we make huge philanthropic investments in public health. It's one of the biggest areas of philanthropic investment as everyone knows, rightly so, but only 2% of that goes to mental health. That clearly needs to change. Similarly, greater investment in health systems. So really holding the ground and accelerating some of those critical areas, but looking at some of the critical areas that are underserved within those portfolios is, is the first thing. Second, I would, I would point to the need for redoubled attention to major collective threats. So if this pandemic has told us anything, it has been a wake up call that we face collective challenges that require truly collective solutions. Um, we obviously have climate, a climate crisis all around us and the threat of broader ecological collapse right by our side. We have issues about the threats of digital technologies along with the incredible promise of digital technologies. Um, I would put extreme inequality uh, in this bucket and I would also put some of the extreme pressures that we see our various political systems facing as well. These are basically all systems issues where systems are either strained or broken, whether they're in our economic systems, our social systems, political or our natural systems. And philanthropies really do have both the agility as well as the patience, you know, the ability to make big bets, the ability to work across silos, across sectors. That's what we don't always do as well as we would like to, but we certainly have the capacity and freedom to do that and to make a decisive difference in some of these critical systems level issues. So that's the second area that I would highlight. And the third is just to bring a wholly new degree of ambition and clarity around issues of justice and equity. So if the second big lesson of this pen, first lesson is about collective uh, threats and the need for collective solutions, the second biggest lesson I think of this pandemic is the bright light that it's shining on a whole range of very ugly and stubborn inequities and at every level. So our seriousness about taking on these issues of justice, equity and inclusion has to inform our work at every level. It obviously means a certain number of things uh, internally as organizations, which I think we'll talk about later in the conversation. But when we think about what we do externally in terms of our financing, our partnerships and our priorities, I think there are a number of dimensions that we need to look at in new ways being really honest about the actual impediments to progress. Um, you know, we've known about racial inequality <clears throat> for an awfully long time. We've known with and dealt with and often invested to try to remedy gender inequality for a very long time. Um, but, but both are stubbornly stuck and they're obviously stuck differently in different contexts. But that means really looking uh, with candor and with bravery at what it is that makes them stuck and finding ways to invest in solutions to overcome those impediments. I do think that means uh, finding a new comfort level and engaging around issues of power and politics. That's not always a comfortable space for philanthropy, but I, I think it's something we have to be uh, able to look at, talk about, and figure out how we can use you know, our various uh, resources and assets, uh, our voice uh, in new ways, because it, it really uh, it 
is I think something we would, we don't want to come back a year from now and say, or certainly 10 years from now and say that we've missed this opportunity to really reset some of our, you know, basic systems around, around issues of much greater equity, uh, inclusion and justice. So all to say, um, I would shorthand that as protecting progress where we've made it and we need to arrest any backward sliding and need to get back on track. Fixing systems, which we all see around us are so essential for our basic lives and livelihoods and justice and equity. It was with great framing to get us started. And I'm just gonna do one quick follow-up. I mean, you, you talked about uh, collective threats and let's not ignore them and the need to fight them. I mean, we've just obviously faced the collective threat. What's one thing that we've learned or we're going to be able to do differently as a result of the muscle we've built dealing with this pandemic on some of those other collective threats? Yeah, well, first, I keep in mind, we're still in the middle. We're not post-COVID yet. <laughs> so I think yeah. that's important. And, and among, among the issues we're wrestling with right now is equitable access to vaccines and speedy access to vaccines. So I hope we solve that challenge with, again, with ambition and seriousness so that when we, you know, the first, the first COVID vaccine was taken today in the United Kingdom, as we all know. So we're just at the beginning of what should be a true collective effort to ensure that vaccines reach those who need it the most and that full considerations of equity are taken into account. So this is a test for all of us. Um, I, I hope and we should all work hard to being able to pass it. Um, I think one of the other lessons that we will need to learn um, and we're still in the middle of grappling with this. Um, you know, one is just the underpinning of, you know, we can't, we can't fight a challenge like this uh, anywhere if we don't do it everywhere. And really internalizing what that means for our systems in civil society, for our political systems and our, our systems of international cooperation. The other real lesson, and, I, and this is before all of us, it's both a lesson and a challenge, is the whole question of prevention and preparedness. You know, we're really, you know, pretty terrible at it as, as a human society, let's face it. We all know that prevention uh, is what we need in health and conflict and any other area, but our systems aren't organized to incentivize it and we tend to forget. So, you know, in the pandemic arena, people always talk about this cycle between panic and neglect. You're in the middle of a crisis, you panic, you solve, and then you go on and you get distracted. And so I think the real challenge coming out of this is gonna be figuring out if there's a way to actually change that, not just with respect to um, pa the pandemic threat and other global health threats, but things like climate change and environmental challenges, which really require sustained effort over time. They're not something you can just, you know, find a solution for once and then move on. Brilliant. Let me, let me turn it to uh, Rohini. I mean, Rohini has set up one of India's leading philanthropies. Um, and Rohini, your, your philanthropy has doubled budgets this year and prioritized underserved groups uh, and issues that, to tackle this crisis. Uh, I'd love you to uh, give your opinion on what are those new priority emerge areas that have emerged for you and, and maybe also just address something that Elizabeth mentioned about how philanthropies can help drive difficult conversations, right? Or equity, justice, uh, these are challenging conversations at, uh, at, in these times. So also keen to see how you've threaded that needle of, of helping drive some important conversations, especially in India where you operate. So namaste everyone. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you, HKJC for having me here. It's quite a privilege to be with so many uh, uh, most important people in the world of philanthropy and civil society. Um, Gaurav, I think Elizabeth has said so much um, that I think all of us would have liked to say. So um, thank you to her. So let me try and uh, instead of repeating something that is very common to us all, let me think of uh, the way I prioritized my philanthropy this year is definitely along the lines that she spoke of that, first of all, to keep all our grantee partners afloat because civil society in India is undergoing so many stresses even before the pandemic came. And so just making sure our partners were able to do what should they do without feeling a threat, imminent threat of closure. Secondly, we were thinking about what they can do to reach out to their constituencies, to build a sense of uh, we can be a part of the solution in all this, even while we are facing the pandemic and related issues from that. So building resilience, having conversations around what resilience will look like with the people who are at the first mile. I think a lot more focus on that this year. And then looking into the future, which is, um, I feel, and you know, I've come to this as an absolute non-techie, uh, but surrounded by techies in my husband's world, I've come to realize that in this digital age, 
it is very, very important for us to create um, a digital civil society as Lucy Bernholz also talks about at Pax and Stanford. And that means enabling civil society uh, to be able to participate in furthering equity, inclusion, justice, democracy, but using digital technologies and making sure that they begin to behave more as though they are in service of society and not just in service of the markets and state. And I think philanthropy has a key role to play in thinking this new issue through, because as you know, we are at the cusp of all kinds of issues to do with privacy, survey, and so many other things. So I think we made a little bit of a pivot to how can digital work better uh, for society. And we did a lot of that through the XTEP Foundation with Nandan, my husband Shankar Maruwada and I set up five years ago, where we thought we should use digital to design for inclusion and improve learning outcomes for 200 million children in India. Obviously this year, that whole infrastructure that we had had the government, it's the government's platform called Diksha, which is a national teacher platform, which XTEP helped them to build. And it was their intent that came through. This year saw more than 1 billion teacher training sessions on it, which would not have happened without that platform because schools were closed, et cetera, et cetera. So the point I'm making is, this year, by doubling down on my on our philanthropy to first look at immediate needs, what is going on, what do they need immediately, rations or whatever, two, keeping civil society organizations afloat, and then three, very quickly looking into the future, which is digital. And in fact, digital came to the rescue of all kinds of things this year. How do we make that not only stronger, bridge the digital divide and use digital for inclusion and equity and democracy uh, in this age? Because this is not the first, this is not the only pandemic. We are going to have more pandemics, not looking forward to them, but there will be, there will be other crises. There will be climate change related incidents. And this year, preparing for that future so that we can enhance our collaboration is what I think we have been doing and what we see as the opportunity for philanthropy and civil society globally. Brilliant. And then maybe you can comment a little bit on one of the things that digital uh, is going through, I mean, aside from privacy, is, is actually also uh, censorship, right? So uh, in one of the areas that uh, you just certainly work on, and Elizabeth talked about, is how, how can philanthropy uh, help having difficult conversation? Anything in that space that you're looking at, which is uh, more in the right space, uh, as opposed to the service delivery space that you're looking at? Yeah. You so in, in my philanthropy, I do have a portfolio called Access to Justice. Uh, we do have a portfolio on independent media and together with many other philanthropists in India, we set up a few years ago the uh, IPSMS, uh, which is not very elegantly named, but is the Independent and Public Spirited Media Foundation. So a lot of people came together to say in these times, we really need media to play the role of being both public spirited and independent in thinking so that you're telling truth to power and telling truth to citizens as well, not just to power. And that has done very well. And we learned that if you can pool risk capital, right? And then perhaps there are ways to have conversations uh, with uh, both uh, governments and society that can push for more transparency and accountability. And similarly, in a few other areas that are now opening up where the, some collaboration is emerging, including in education. So yes, um, it is possible to push the needle a little bit. Maybe I'll bring uh, Leong in now. Uh, he is the executive director of Charities and Community of Asia's largest foundation. Uh, the Hong Kong Jockey Club. Uh, I think, and I think what's amazing about this organization is not just the size of giving, uh, but just the focus of that giving into Hong Kong. So uh, I feel like, uh, Leong, whenever you decide to invest in a particular area, that itself uh, generates uh, a lot of momentum. You, know, you are clearly a gender set as given the large amount of uh, capital that you're able to deploy in a such a focused way. So very curious um, to know what are, what are the new agendas for you uh, that you see emerging during and post this crisis? And maybe also worth digging into the education point that uh, Rohini uh, just raised. Uh, how does, what does that digital education uh, role feel like in Hong Kong? 
Sure. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Graf. Yeah, I think I resonate, first of all, with a lot of uh, what Elizabeth and Wohini uh, just mentioned. Uh, and also, I think, interestingly, mental health is also a big concern of, I guess, uh, the audiences uh, tonight. So perhaps I try to uh, talk about in, in those few dimensions uh, of um, some specific examples of how and, and what we, we have done. You know, I think in April, we share that uh, at that time, it's, it's about agility. It is about empowerment. Uh, it was about creativity. So a uh, couple of waves after, uh, and now we look at it and we have some exper experiences and experiments, and we're also looking forward. I think what we found is, I think many people share in this room, is that you see a disproportionate impact you know, on certain segment uh, of the community when COVID hits uh, in the last uh, 10, 12 months. Now, particularly if, if we come to education, you know, we have pretty big programs before uh, to support uh, children with special education need, like autistic kids, for example, ADHD, uh, or ethnic minorities who are trying to learn you know, the local language. But these programs, they, they all hit into a certain roadblock because you have to learn from home. A lot of the traditional way of trying to build social emotional uh, way, uh, mostly face to face, uh, those run into you know, significant um, challenge. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we spend, we, we need to, I think in the future as well, uh, spend time on how we manage classroom diversity uh, in that sense, whether with COVID or without COVID. Uh, in a classroom today, in Hong Kong, for example, a teacher goes into the classroom, say a 35 uh, children classroom, you have probably three to five with special education need. And then you have three to five uh, new immigrants. You have one or two ethnic minorities. You know, our teachers are also in a way, you know, not sure if every one of them are equipped with the methodology, or, you know, or the, the emotional kind of training to deal with a classroom like that. Uh, not to mention even going forward, we have, you know, uh, a digital divide also within that classroom. So how do we, how do we bridge that? I think that would be something that um, at least we will be spending a lot of time on to think about you know, diversity management, to think about what that meant uh, in education. I think the other area also, um, uh, you know, um, Rohinia mentioned uh, is really very big on digital transformation. And this goes beyond education. This also goes into social services. Uh, and in a way uh, now, you know, it's, it's bad time in COVID, but it's also good time to advocate technology. You know, all of a sudden, every social worker is very receptive of using technology, whereby, you know, in the past, you might need a little bit more time to convince people to adapt to a new way of doing things. Uh, I'll also give you a very quick example. I mean, something we launched back in October 2018, which actually come now into play during COVID extremely uh, important. It's a service called Open Up. So this is a 24-7 social media-based, text-based uh, counseling service, uh, as you can imagine, mainly for young people, because um, they don't seek help face-to-face -face anymore. They don't seek help through telephones anymore. Uh, so you need to offer some platform whereby they feel comfortable uh, seeking help. So there was a platform that was launched uh, about two years ago. Uh, in only two years time, we have managed uh, about 300,000 sessions, uh, served 56,000 cases. And out of that, about 2,000 would be high risk or crisis case whereby really lives have been saved. I think something like that, when we look at COVID and exactly map you know, the different waves in Hong Kong, we see volumes change you know, the volumes of seeking help and the keywords that uh, they, were, they were seeking help for, from. You know, something like that, it's a verbatim record of all the counseling sessions whereby we can run machine learning, you can use AI to evaluate risk levels. You can learn from these experience as we have more and more users, you can, you can learn from it and make the platform even more relevant uh, to the people that, who, who need help. So I think those sort of things, in a way, I, I see them as, I mean, to say it's a good thing coming out from COVID, it's, it's bad, I understand that. 
But I think you know whatever silver lining we can get uh, in through this experience, we should try uh, to get as much uh, as uh, as possible out of it, so that it helps us also going uh, forward. Yeah, it's a, it's a great theme that's emerging. I mean, I don't think philanthropies five years ago thought they would use the word digital transformation as something that was part of their DNA. But we also recognize that uh, the shape that digital takes is has a has a justice social justice flavor to it. So philanthropies do need to get involved in the design. And actually, this might be a great uh, time to uh, bring in um, Dennis uh, from the Lemon Foundation, because I know Dennis, uh, one of your big areas of investments is around education and, uh, and and really taking it digital and so forth. So I'd love for you to share that experience and also share, you know, what how are you guys thinking about the future? What are some of the new agendas that you guys are, are bringing in? And just to, uh, you know, Lemon has a rich history of giving in Brazil's education uh, space. And it's actually great for us to have one of the largest uh, uh, foundations in Brazil uh, be with us today. So I know it's not always easy time zones to bring uh, such diverse groups together, but thank you for joining us, uh, Dennis. But love to hear from you about that experience. Hi, uh, Gorev and everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and joining this event. I, I feel I have nothing to say after the uh, listening to my colleagues uh, speaking, and I'm desperately trying to think about something new to bring to the table. So I'll give you a little bit of context answering your question and then I'll introduce a new theme. Um, I think uh, uh, the Lemon Foundation is focused on ensuring that Brazil can be a more developed and fair country. And the only way we see this happening is if we stop wasting talent. We think human resource is Brazil's most important resource. And, and we, are, we are not doing a good job as a society, as a country managing it. And we see two places where this is not going particularly well and where the foundation can make a difference. One is on basic education, as you mentioned, how can we ensure that every kid who is enrolled in school, Brazil is able to offer a free public school close to the home with a certified teacher, with textbooks by age six for every kid in the country, by age four for over 80%. But when you go all the way uh, to high school and you look at the kids graduating, you see 40% dropout rates, which is very, very high. But the worst number is that only about 10% of the kids who actually finish high school are ready for life. They have learned and developed the skills in school that allow them to be ready to go for higher education, for technical education, for you know, a, a civic life and make a difference in our country. So we're living, you know, leaving a lot of kids behind. And this is definitely being a major source of, of uh, um, affecting Brazil's growth. And I'm not talking only about the economic consequences of non-educated kids. Of course, there is a big, the, the World Bank just published that Brazil is only using about 55% of its all productivity because of the lack of effective, high quality public education in the country. But I think it goes well beyond the economic productivity. It goes to, you know, kids' potentials, dreams, creativity, finding the next you know, big entrepreneurs or the people who are going to cure cancer or bring new, you know, ideas to the world. We're just, you know, in a 210 million people country, we're just leaving a lot of kids behind. Second place where we see that uh, talent is not being properly managed in Brazil, and I think that's true to many other countries who are participating in this conference, is that we are not being, like, allocating our most talented people to tackling our hardest, hardest problems. Right in in society, our incentives is basically you know if you're very very bright, you're going to go work for a consultancy, you're going to work for investment banks, you're going to go to the new fancy startup, you know the new fintech doing you know whatever. And of course, a lot of those things are very important. They're going to generate you know uh, uh, taxes and things like that. We feel that if you have like very persistent social problems. You're not, it's not going to be enough to throw a lot of money to solve them. You should be throwing your best brains around it, right? We as a society should be kind of gathering the right people and putting them together, diverse set of views, uh, people from different backgrounds, people who really live the problem, people who think about, you know, from an academic perspective, from a government public policy perspective, from a civil society perspective, from an entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial perspective, and put them together and allocate them. 
because these problems are not only morally more important for a country when we talk about fighting a pandemic, which now became very real uh, for a lot of people, but in the past decades was not real. People thinking about pandemic uh, uh, relief or, or development of vaccines were not particularly valued in our society, right? We were not talking about them on the paper. They were not getting the biggest salaries or the biggest recognition necessarily. And now we're seeing how this is important, but this is true for climate change. This is true for persistent uh, uh, quality learning at scale in basic education. This is true for you know, bridging the digital divide. We, these are not only morally important problems, but they are problems that deserve and need our best people because they are truly complex, right? And I think the way we have been approaching this as a society is kind of living that as an afterthought. Like what's really important is our other things. And then we are frustrated that we're not solving them fast enough being philanthropists or being governments, right? When we look at that, I think, I think we should give a proper role uh, for attracting our best people and, and supporting them throughout the career in tackling persistent social problems. So this is what we're trying to do in Brazil. We work at very large scale uh, in our country. And during the pandemic, uh, we saw Brazil, unfortunately, schools are still closed. We closed our schools in March 16th and they haven't been open so far. Uh, there's very little hope it will it will finish our, our school year is the calendar year. So schools are going to finish in the next two weeks. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to open them in, in early February when school year resumes. Uh, but that's a big fight. So what the Lemon Foundation did in cooperation with other foundations in Brazil was in mid-March put together a system where kids could move online. Right? Brazil doesn't have a, tra a tradition of hybrid learning or online learning. So if schools need to be closed, they are simply closed and kids stay home. That's the tradition. If there is a strike or if there's a natural disaster and you need to close a school, then the kids sit home. And we thought this was just going to be unacceptable. And we worked together with municipal and state districts, uh, school districts all over the country. Uh, and I can talk about this later in more detail if people are interested. But the result is that now we have 92% of Brazilian public school students studying online. When I talk about 92%, I'm talking about kids who are doing at least two hours of online activity or through TV. We've put together the capacity to distribute high quality content using TV networks for kids who don't have access to internet. Um, and we also were able to negotiate on in several places around the country, unfortunately not the whole country, that data for the students uh, uh, using the learning apps was free. So they were not being charged. The families were not being charged. Unfortunately, it does not happen everywhere in the country. Where it happened, you see levels of like, you know, almost 100% of the kids uh, doing their classes. I'm not comparing that to real education in classroom education, but I think it was an important step to reduce a little bit of the burden on families and especially to reduce the lack of learning uh, that was happening in our country, especially for a long term. Last point I, I want to make here is, I mean, it's possible to use online education as many others said before me. We think this is a trend that will continue. We're seeing a major shift in teachers' perception of online learning. Teachers are using digital to tools. As Rohini said about the XTEP uh, uh, platform in India, our platform, Nova Escola in Brazil, we are having 70% of the teachers using our digital lesson plans every month uh, uh, in Brazil. So we never saw that level. Uh, of usage, I'm not going to use absolute numbers because saying that after India, it's just, you know, you can never get a good absolute number when you talk about, you know, billion and, and India, but, you know, it was a, a for a small country like Brazil, uh, it was very significant. And, but I think the other area that we need to focus as philo philanthropy that I think we don't discuss enough is leadership development. And this is where the foundation has been thinking about like building the infrastructure to avoid the new crisis, being a public health crisis or any other crisis. How can we use the next 10 years to really build the next generation of leaders who are going to be leading government, key government positions, key civil society positions, key positions in academia? How can we increase the perceived value of these people in society? How can we train and equip them for a very volatile world? How can we have them be like digital uh, first uh, approach to those problems? So I think how can we accelerate and build this should be 
a focus in our philanthropic efforts because independently of the thematic area that you all focus on and that we all focus on, if you don't have a good leader, it's very hard to see change happening. If you don't have a good leader in government, uh, we saw that countries who have bad leaders uh, and incompetent leaders are facing much harder uh, situations and consequences from COVID than others. I'm not going to mention any leaders, but if you look at the data, you can see that, right? The same thing if you look at grassroots level. You have people, organizations that were ex you know, extremely well led. They were able to grow and find new donors and distribute funds quickly and really make a difference in people's life. Vaccine development, where we were very, very involved and other things like that. Right, so we, we definitely think leadership should become a key focus uh, uh, of philanthropy over the next decades. And we are definitely making a big push uh, in our investments in this area. Thank you. Yeah, Dennis, thanks for that. I mean, some great points there, especially bringing up the whole talent development side, which I agree is, is, is often uh, not thought about, but remarkable numbers from going from zero engagement online to the levels that you're describing. So I actually want to ask Sitsi this question. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've seen a kind of a very joyful embrace of, of digital and there's certainly a lot of potential there. Um, and keen to uh, hear from her, uh, Sitsi runs the High Life Foundation, one of the sort of dominant philanthropies uh, in Africa, but also as someone who chairs the Africa Philan Philanthropy Forum. So brings a great perspective, both in her personal giving but also across Africa. Um, just keen to understand whether you have the same view uh, on the opportunity that digital offers and what are some of the new, um, I, I guess, agendas that you're seeing and hearing from the ground. And one thing I would just add is, you know, we did just do a survey in India, I just completed a month ago of how many children actually accessed online or remote education. So there was a lot that was offered but how many children actually accessed it? And 40% of children accessed zero levels of remote education, which came as a complete shock to everybody. So I just add that little fact and see if, Sitsi, what do you think about uh, the role that digital could play or some of the new agendas, uh, especially in an African context? Thank you so much, uh, Gaurav. And the conversations we've been having so far are so thought provoking and I have to say, Dennis, I need your email address and your telephone number. We are honestly on the same page. Uh, when I look at the areas that we focused on that we really felt uh, uh, were priority areas for us, it's people. The priority was people. If you have a fragile uh, uh, health system coupled with poor political leadership, Lack of resources. What do you do when you face a pandemic that the whole world is facing? So it, we had to have a lot of humility in recognizing that the only way we could make our dollar stretch, uh, our collaborations more meaningful, the way we could be catalytic uh, in the way we identify programs to fund and, uh, and to work on, we had to be focused on the people, not the disease. So we did projects in, uh, in education. We have a, a, a platform again. Um, we went into uh, digital education uh, more than eight years ago. It wasn't popular because people always felt that they had other options. But once COVID hit, we were, our platforms were the platforms of choice. So we developed two, one focused on um, primary and high school students and another one for early childhood development, focusing on equipping teachers with the right tools and, and, and information to give a, uh, a, a, a good service to uh, early, early uh, learners. And primarily also focusing on teachers who had very little training because they isn't quite an infrastructure in a lot of the African countries, including my, my home country, Zimbabwe, for training uh, teachers in, uh, for um, early childhood uh, development and education. So we've, we've found ourselves really having to constantly say to ourselves, how do we build resilience through the people that we are working with? So 
in, in one particular project I would love to, uh, to speak about is, some of you may have come across a, 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 a BBC article where, which reported that seven children were still born in this one particular hospital uh, uh, in, in, in Harare, the capital city of Zimbabwe. And it really sent shockwaves in so many uh, places. And a friend, a fellow philanthropist sent me an email and said, what can we do in order to help? And I said, uh, we can try to see how we can improve infrastructure. We can try to see how we can invest in, in equipment because the reason why it happened was uh, some said lack of equipment, others said, well, uh, the doctors were on strike. But really at the end of the day, it happened because of the condition of the heart of the service providers, the doctors, the nurses, the midwives who were supposed to be there to be able to protect. Now, did they do that? Did they, the death of the children uh, come about as a result of hard-heartedness of, uh, of the staff members? No, it was fear because there, there wasn't any uh, PPE protective uh, clothing available that would give the, the health workers the confidence to go out and help the mothers. So as we unpacked uh, the issues and try to get to the bottom of what the, where the problem was, it was very apparent for us that we have to really invest in people. And leadership is also at the key and, and right at the center of uh, things we need to talk about. Having a robust conversations on why our leadership is failing on so many fronts and so many sectors, and why uh, we are not uh, finding people step forward with solutions quickly and, uh, and uh, being more responsive. So the, while I, I, I do understand the importance of uh, investing in digital technology and, uh, and tools that help us to reach to as many people as possible. But I really felt in our case, the issue was about how do we build leaders who are ethical? How do we get people to love other people again, to be more caring, to be more concerned? How do we create the platforms that allow us to be more honest about why are we failing as a, as a nation? Why are we failing uh, as communities? Another uh, area I just want to touch on quickly that, um, got us really going that motivated many of us, not just within the foundation, but uh, our, our partners and our community of the thousands of, of students and young leaders that we work with, was we thought, well, we don't want to go through uh, another crisis of this nature and end up looking helpless and, and not having some degree of, of, of solutions that we can offer ourselves. So we had begun conversations on what does it take to help Zimbabwe become an upper middle income country? So once COVID hit and we saw the food insecurity, we saw the fragile health systems, the uh, schools closing, borders closing, we then took a step further and decided to really work through strategically on what does it take for us to become a middle, upper middle income country and what are the resources that as philanthropists, we need to catalyze the conversations, the research, the processes, so that we truly are able to identify what are the areas we need to put uh, uh, money in as uh, philanthropists, as the private sector, as government, and also casting a vision that young people can rally behind. Because if by being able to see what Zimbabwe can become, it motivated people to uh, get out of the, the, the fear and the, 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 just the mental stress of COVID and begin to see what is be beyond COVID and the opportunities that lie ahead. If we work together as a community and we are more intentional and, uh, and more wise in how we deploy our resources. I think it's, it's, it's great that you brought Put the person at the center. I, I feel like uh, whenever you call up an IT help desk and talk about technology, ultimately what they come down to is it's a user issue. I think you've put that very much at the center of this. Um, 
Maria, maybe I'll turn to you uh, as, as someone sort of who's come from the investment world and, and, and leads innovative finance at Rockefeller. Uh, you know, you guys have been busy since we had our last conversation with Rockefeller back in April um, from ongoing pandemic response to a first ever bond being issued on COVID-19 and your ongoing pursuit for, uh, on energy. You put, you know, double down on your energy efforts, uh, energy access. I'm curious, how did you guys decide on these priorities amongst what has been a turbulent year? And I'm sure there are many things sort of thrown at you. How did you come to the ones that you focused on and what does that mean for the future? Well, thank you, Gora, for having me. Um, very happy to be part of this group. And, and just listening to all these comments, I, I have to say, I'm, I, there's, a, there's an optimism I feel in the sense that we, I think, are talking about similar things and similar priorities um, as we go through this conversation. Um, so for Rockefeller, um, and this builds, I think, on, on what Elizabeth uh, started us off with, is you know what did we need to do like at this moment in time both with our current work and the collective threat which at that moment was really we had to respond to the pandemic and um like others we we did a real assessment of where can rockefeller be most effective um each of our organizations, each of these philanthropies, we go deep in different areas. And I think what the pandemic has really shown is that, look, we don't have the luxury of time and we had to respond as quickly and as effectively as we could. So the immediate focus for us, and it's really been, um, it's been an incredibly busy year, was just how do we respond immediately to the pandemic? And in doing so, what was Rockefeller's role? And there uh, it's been the our, our health work and we have um, uh, doubled down our efforts in testing, tracing, and ultimately that's going to be equitable vaccine distribution. So for us, this was a global health crisis. We had to come together. We recognized that as the foundation, we were only so big. So all of that effort has been a collaborative it's actually refocused a lot of our efforts, um, not just on our work in the emerging markets, but back in the United States, which has been very different from the foundation and has been a monumental uh, shift in the past six months. But immediately it was, how do we address the collective threat now? And then as we go forward, there's a number of themes that came out that I think all resonate and that's um, resilience, the health response and this concept of equitable recovery, equitable access. And we just did, I think what, what um, some of my colleagues did is where is, is the foundation best positioned to that? We also took a big bet for the first time in the history of the foundation, the foundation's 107 years old, but we issued a charitable bond for $700 million in October. And we had never done that before. We have the benefit of having a strong balance sheet and at a time of low interest rates, we really felt like um, there's a lot of work, for example, that we can do over the next 10, 20, 30 years, but probably the work that we do over the next one, two, three years is going to have much more of an impact. And it was not an easy decision because it was the first time we'd gone to the market, but we felt it was the right thing to do. And I guess going forward where we're planning to, to focus um, again, around these themes of resiliency and equitable recovery um, is uh, we have more work to do. It's been said here on, on the health response. And there, um, I think it's really as we shift from testing and tracing to um, the vaccine distribution, make sure everyone has access to, um, to the vaccine and, and um, the, health, uh, the health support that goes along with that. That's a key area for us. And then we sat back and looked at our work and what do we best do going forward? And I'd say our areas of focus there are threefold. One is then building on this resiliency work. How do we get together and collaborate? Um, it's not just gonna be Rockefeller, but putting in place a global health uh, response mechanism, if you will, that will specifically focus on detecting, 
preventing and, and containing future pandemics. And whether that's an institution within current institutions, what we have to do in addition to that, I think there's more work to be done there. Second area of focus, and it is our big initiative, is um, energy access. At the end of the day, um, to empower people to um, be productive uh, in a modern economy, they need power. And you still have um, nearly a billion people who have no access to power. And then if you add on top of that uh, populations where power and, and electricity access is inconsistent and quality is poor, you know, that's another 2 billion people. That's a huge portion of the global community. And so um, we are putting a lot of our bond proceeds behind um, driving uh, green infrastructure and driving um, what I would say is historic public private investment in distributable renewable energy. And then finally, you know, it's this, um, there is such a need for capital and there's such a need for people to help in these areas of social impact. And um, the concept of impact investing started at the Rockefeller Foundation. And we are firm believers that this is not just a separate area, but this absolutely has to be mainstream. And, and you know, whether, uh, yeah, I, I, I really think that um, it, 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 it starts with philanthropies setting the way, but it's also many other institutions. And I think we wanna do all that we can to develop this field further because this just absolutely has to be mainstreamed and has to be part of the, the consciousness of you know, institutional investors, um, the, the broader communities so that, uh, that uh, we can be more resilient because if we don't address social impact in you know, all of the, I guess, uh, profit oriented um, angles of the economy as well. I mean, what are we really investing for? I mean, to me, this has to be mainstream. So if I had to say like, th those are really um, areas that we're gonna concentrate on going forward. No, and I, I think uh, very exciting, but all, especially I think this whole way in which you have been able to align your cash flows with where you're seeing the greatest need. I mean, that, that, that bond issuance is a, is a remarkable uh, approach. And I think something many of us can learn from. I'm going to turn it back to Rohini, uh, and we, you know we covered a lot of ground in this first round. In fact, we've covered many of my other questions. Um, but I, I know Rohini, you may have to leave in ten minutes, so we'll excuse you. But uh, if we can just grab your uh, next few minutes, I, I think there's still this question of what are we at risk of underinvesting in and just losing sight of, and the question of what have philanthropies like a bit of self reflection on what have we learned about how we need to operate differently. So as as, as someone who uh, has essentially started this philanthropy and help and runs it. I, I think great to turn to you and ask, what are we at risk of underinvesting in going forward? Uh, and what do you, how would you, how do you think you need to operate differently as a philanthropy based on the lessons of the, of the last nine months? Yeah. Thank you, Gaurav. So I think while we have learned a lot this year, all of us together, I think we mustn't forget, and this, this thread was picked up by both Sitsi and Dennis, that at the end of it, we can't lose sight of people's need for agency and choice, okay? So whatever we design, whatever we design must have that at the core of it. How do we increase people's agency and uh, ability to solve their own problems in their own context. Uh, our teams have sort of created a wraparound framework that we call societal platform thinking for this. Everyone is welcome to look it up at societalplatform.org. But the idea really is, um, yes, technology can be the backbone, but technology should enable what? And what are we at risk of forgetting? That sometimes efficiency and equity can be orthogonal. And so if we want to keep equity at the center, then we must focus on distributing the ability to solve. So rather than trying to push one solution, sometimes philanthropists or civil society organizations, we can think, we can fall into the trap of thinking that we know some of the answers, 
But if anything in my 30 year old journey, I know is that we may have the power of our intent, but we really have to focus on developing the real grammar of our intent so that we are pushing out agency and not pulling back power, okay, into our own zones. And that's what we could easily forget, whether we are designing for the vaccines, whether we are designing to uh, say whatever, whatever sector that might be. So that's my short answer to your question of what are we at the risk of forgetting because we may push for large programs because we feel urgency uh, you know we feel all those things but uh, i would say while i i think it is urgent times because in this one year we have slipped back so much on things like sdgs that we are going to have to run just to catch up and then surge ahead but while we do that constantly thinking and keeping people at the focus there is talent everywhere we must use use the world's and certainly in my country, my nation's diversity to allow people, more and more people to feel that they can become part of the solution. Others, if they feel they remain part of the problem and somebody else has to solve their problems, then you people feel helpless, hapless, hopeless, and we have to prevent that. So that's what philanthropy and civil society should never forget to keep on doing. And your second question was, so therefore philanthropy, therefore, all of us know this, no need to say it, but we do keep saying it and at, risk, at the risk of repetition, I'll say that we know that Samaj, Bazaar and Sarkar, that is state, civil society and market need to collaborate to solve any problem. You simply cannot do it without all the three sectors. And so how can philanthropy focus on reducing the friction among these three sectors to collaborate? How can we focus on that? So how can we create sort of horizontal portfolios across our philanthropies to, to reduce the friction, to build back trust, to build trust now in various ways, to create actual programs and frameworks for rebuilding trust now so that the next time some pandemic or climate related or anything happens, we are in a much, much better position to quickly deploy um, you know, our first responses together. So those, I think, are the clear opportunity of enhanced collaboration, of rebuilding trust, of working across the three sectors of Samaj, Bazaar, Sarkar, society, state, and markets. And of course, to repeat the earlier theme, to use a digital backbone so that we can have scale, speed, uh, etc. but to do it in a way where we are not technology-led, but technology-enabled so that we can use digital to distribute the ability to solve. I think we are going to be better prepared next time. And now all of us have much more renewed humility, okay? Even the big philanthropists, right? So with this, we, this okay. renewed humility is a good time for us to regroup and sort of make new beginnings. Roini, that's a great clarion call. It's very clear. Uh, but I'm not going to let you go without asking a tough question and because you use the oh. word equity. Uh, and Elizabeth uh, talked a bit about questioning our power structures. There's so much inequity that needs to be challenged. Now, the reality is that a good amount of philanthropies are philanthropies that are funded by private individuals and the larger ones obviously funded by billionaires. And billionaires at the same time are what for many people uh, epitomize the challenge of equity. And there is, a, uh, there is a fair question to be asked that can we trust such organizations to truly do the most difficult things that are required uh, to upend the system? Because I certainly think what Elizabeth said was that we need to do some serious questioning. Will we get serious questioning out of philanthropies that are funded by billionaires? Can I put that yeah. question to you? No, I Since think- Since we're friends. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a very fair question to ask. I mean, look everywhere I'm reading that the richest, all of us became even richer in the pandemic. It's not necessarily something we should be proud of. I mean, what kind of society have we created where some of us are so wealthy that for 10 generations, we don't have to worry, right? That is why so many of us have joined the giving pledge and we have at least committed to 50% of giving away. I would say to those who have, whether through the giving pledge or anything else, decided to give away their money. Think of this decade as your decade of opportunity to do whatever you're doing much faster, make many more mistakes, put out risk capital, and don't be afraid to, to, to fund 
exactly the change in the systemic structure which has allowed this kind of inequity to go beyond being useful for society. Some wealth is obviously useful for society because it allows innovation, blah, blah, blah. But this kind of inequity, let the billionaires themselves question it and do stuff to create, to push innovation. As I said, if we don't use our philanthropy to distribute the ability to solve, if we use our wealth to concentrate more power, then we are not doing any good for society and not doing good for ourselves as well. So I kind of feel strongly about this. Eventually, an ideal society would be where philanthropy itself would be redundant, right? That's not coming anytime soon. But it is always important to keep the question of the power of the rich on the table so that we are at least self-aware when we are doing our philanthropy, right? And we are coming, as I said, from humility, from self-awareness, that eventually it is about power structures. And, you know, they say that, well, one of my mentors says that the stick is never given away. It has to be taken away. There seems to be a shift in the world and we must become aware of this where people are saying what's going on with all these super rich should we give them the power will they ever change the world i don't think we can rely on the super rich to change the world it has to be when all of us don our hats as citizens first all of us whether you work in the government or you're the head of a big corporation or anything you're a citizen first if we can all step back a bit bit look at ourselves in the mirror every day and say as a citizen what kind of society do i really want to belong to maybe some of these issues will get resolved but the conversation must continue there must be a public spotlight on how much good philanthropy is doing versus how much unintended mostly unintended bad consequences there can be because of a concentration of power and for us, we take this question very seriously, which is why in what we call societal platform thinking, every day we ask, how can we make sure with metrics in place that you're act actually distributing power to solve problems and not capturing it? Sorry, that sounded like a bit of a lecture and I got overheated there for a minute, but it's a very important question for all of us to ponder. So thank you for that opportunity. No, 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 I opened the door and, you know, I think, it's true that skepticism abounds, but I have to say, I, I, I believe you. I think that, that, thank you for answering that so, so clearly. And I appreciate you taking that tough question. Uh, maybe I'll, uh, and I know you may have to drop off, so we'll, we'll excuse you whenever you need to. Uh, but Sitsi, maybe I'll turn to you. I mean, you are, uh, I, I remember how impassioned you were about this yourself uh, when we spoke six, seven months ago. And the need to give when times are down, the need to give when times are up. Uh, I mean, you know, nine months into it, there's a big question on the table of equity and promoting equity. How are, how are you thinking about uh, preserving those important issues going forward so they're not forgotten? And what are the things that you're thinking about doing differently uh, as a philanthropy based on what you've learned? Uh, so Gaurav, I'm just going to be very honest. I don't have uh, philanthropists calling and asking, how do we collaborate? How are we going to relook at the models, the way we've been doing giving? I just believe people are back to where they were. They, are pri they have their own priorities. They will put their money where they want their money to go. And that's the reality we all have to face. People are going to continue to put money where they feel their priorities are. And it's the, it's the leadership uh, role of every individual that we need to be thinking about. At the grassroots level, people, we have to think about what are we, what is each individual going to do to make a change and to, to reframe the kind of life, the quality of life that they want. As long as that doesn't happen, there's no philanthropist who's going to come from somewhere and drive that change. Number two, also, which country, tell me which country in this world has ever been developed by donors? I don't know of any. It's the people we we'll make a decision that enough is enough. We need to take the issues into our own hands and lead and make the, the changes we want to change. Having said that, <laughs> I still believe as, as one who has been really blessed, we're very blessed as a family to be able to have what we have. But I honestly feel we need to accelerate the giving more and be very bold at what we are investing in. What, what are the, 
the kind of programs we are putting our philanthropic dollars in, if they don't cause the economies to grow, cause uh, equitable distribution of wealth, empower people at every level so kids don't have to be walking kilometers to go to school, uh, power is, is not a luxury, then we are dreaming. Look, great reality check, firstly. And I think there, there is something there also about the fact that we're going back, I mean, if, you, if you're feeling like we're gonna go right back to where we started, I think there's a real opportunity for collaboration that's begging at the moment. Um, and so perfect. And, and maybe I'll ask Leon, you know, venerable institution, right? Old community organization, a, a trust that has to think about so many different stakeholders uh, and suddenly faced with a pandemic, what, you know, where you have to act quick and, and many of that uh, conservatism has to go out the door. What, what do you, what have you learned as an organization, as a philanthropy uh, about over the last nine months? And what are the things you're thinking about doing differently? Again, as an organization, as opposed to the topics you invest in? Sure. No, I, many years ago, I read a book called Elephant Can Dance. So I think that probably sum, sum up the, the situation. You know, we're a very big organization, like you said, a lot of different stakeholders. But I think, um, you know, if you, if you see the social issue, you want to be bold, you want to take on the social issue. Uh, and very interestingly, you see Elephant can actually dance. Um, so in our situation, we very quickly put out various programs. Uh, I think we deployed so far in the last 10 months uh, on the ground, uh, already close to 100 million US dollar. Um, a lot of the, the empowerment programs that we try to do work with our local partners takes about two weeks from application to you know, money in the bank. So I think, I think um, again, it is, uh, it is imagination, it is the courage that, that, one, um, that one undertake. Uh, and, then, and then I think a lot of these processes uh, we, can, we can overcome. But of course, I have to say, you know, I, I always feel like you know, the last 10 months, very interestingly, for a lot of philanthropies is a reflection time that almost is like back to convention. Right. I mean, traditionally, our understanding, at least in China, in Chinese um, culture, the philanthropies is like, oh, there is a, a hunger. Uh, so you set up some booth uh, and you distribute out a rice bowl to, to everyone. Uh, I think, of course, in a, for a long time, we talk about system change. We talk about, you know, advocate, advocating certain things. But I think it's still very important. I think this pandemic bring us to realize uh, we need to be relevant as a philanthropist. We just need to be relevant to the people at the end of the day that we want to support. So, you know, a time like this, I think it's a very good point of reflection that, you know, we're not that above. We are, we, we need to be close to the people we want to serve. Of course, you know, I think multiple of my colleagues mentioned, and I totally agree, we need to be, you have that level of humility, you know, no donor build a country. Uh, similarly, we can't even collectively, you know, solve all the problems in the society. Uh, but I think, but, but I think our role is also very unique, whereby we can and we should try to innovate and collaborate. Uh, and using these examples, uh, better with evidence, but even without, using these pilots and examples and and good way of doing things uh, to rally them more awareness and and more other. Uh, people to um, you know to do the good things together. Wonderful, and uh, I know we're starting to get short on time. And I wanted to let the audience know. Try and put your questions in the Q and A box, and I'll invite the panelists wherever you want to type a response. Feel free to quickly type it so we can get through as many as possible. Uh, but we'll try and ask them. Uh, Elizabeth, I do want to ask you this question again, coming all, all the way back to that global perspective. I know international institutions, in some way, uh, have been waning, have been under attack. Uh, yeah, there's a need for greater global coordination. What do you? What would you ask from philanthropies? Uh, if, you know, if you, you have a whole audience here, not just the panelists of philanthropists. What do you think they need to be acting or doing differently uh, to for us to be able to do better next time we're faced with these kind of collective threats? 
Yeah, well, um, thank you for the question. And just, I first just want to thank everybody for this incredible conversation. I feel like my brain is exploding and in a good way. And I'm just eager to follow up conversations in all kinds of ways. And a thousand percent agree with everything that has been said so far. Um, look, I think, you know, um, philanthropy goes, has trends <laughs> and goes in waves. And it's been interesting. So I've been in the field of international cooperation in some form or fashion my entire career. And I, I remember a period of time when there was huge philanthropic investment in global issues, in the kind of underpinnings of cooperation. And a lot of that was driven by dynamics around the Cold War. I'm dating myself, I go back that far, but, but there was huge investment. And then it flipped, right? And then it sort of decided it wasn't interested in any of those things anymore. It's not that that wasn't important anymore, but nonetheless, the, the resourcing shifted. I think the first thing I would, you know, and that's fair enough, right? To see these points, philanthropists are going to invest in what they care the most about. But I think it's important that, that we all begin to develop a shared account for the kind of infrastructure we need uh, and the systems we need in the world to allow people and societies to thrive. My own view is that an crucial part of that is some kind of underpinning of global cooperation that can look like a lot of different things. Some kind of underpinning of investment in global public goods that can you know, be manifest in a lot of different ways. That plays itself out also in societies at the national level, obviously, and even in communities. But we need to build a stronger shared understanding about what is required for that kind of cooperative, both, both the, the kind of institutions and systems for cooperation, but also the culture of cooperation and the value of cooperation, because I, it's hard to see us thriving as a species, thriving as citizens, thriving as communities in the future we're moving into, unless we develop much stronger uh, ties to each other and ways of expressing those in meaningful ways that deliver you know, uh, the kind of goods that we require as, as citizens, communities, families, and countries and a broader global community. So, you know, I would mostly just appeal for people to, to think about where those kinds of issues fit in your larger account of, of how you create change in the world. Um, and, you know, for those who are interested in it, I think there's scope to do much more kind of strategic collaboration around, uh, around some of the ways that those systems have to evolve. And, you know, some of that's about financing, but a lot of it's about ideas. A lot of it's about other forms of collaboration, very much connecting the global to the local in ways that has not been done nearly enough. The last kind of point that I would make here is, and the point about culture, I mean, so I have spent my career working mostly around cooperation and a lot of that is often technocratic, right? It's a lot about tools and instruments and institutions. And of course you need all of those things to work, but have uh, lately, uh, you know, I've certainly been thinking, and I think there's a lot of new thinking about pretty deep culture and what kind of culture it is that's required or cultures that are required to sustain cooperation, what leads people at an individual level to reach out a hand to their neighbor, to reach out a hand to a stranger, to think that someone else's welfare matters to them. That goes really deep to some pretty deep fundamentals of psychology and culture. And I th think there is um, precious little prospect of solving some of our deeper challenges unless we find ways to ignite and inspire and invest in that. A lot of different dimensions to it, but I think there's really interesting scope for philanthropic um, consideration of some of those questions too. Wonderful thoughts. Uh, it's a great way of encapsulating that. And I think uh, some messages for us to take away. Uh, I've, I've got three questions here from the, uh, from the Q and A box and I'm gonna uh, assign them now and ask each of you to try and answer them in a, in a minute or two. So just we keep to time. And I wanna start with Simon's question, which is a really great one um, around the need for, for philanthropies to really listen to vulnerable communities. And, and I mean, I, you know, I'm sure we all claim we listen, so perhaps to listen in a different way uh, to truly understand what, what it is that's, that's needed. And, um, and I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna suggest this uh, to um, Maria. Uh, Maria, as, a, as obviously a organization that's based in New York, but working really across the globe, love to hear from you about how you're thinking about listening differently to really get a sense of the pulse on the ground, which has really come up, uh, I think, as an issue in a, in a pandemic where everything is so dynamic and the, the need to really understand what's happening locally is even, even more heightened, although it was always in, important. Uh, Dennis, I'd love you to answer a, a question around, is there a silver lining here for education uh, or are we just trying to make up for a deficit that this pandemic caused? Are we, has this pandemic potentially put us on 
a higher equilibrium in the future that we can achieve as a result? Is there, is there some sort of uh, silver lining uh, around that? Uh, and then Sitsi, uh, there's a question here around just that understanding of the role of corporate uh, philanthropy versus private philanthropy in these times. Do you, do you see a difference uh, in, in the approach? And you know, if you were to uh, tell a corporate philanthropy what you think it should rather be focused on versus what a family philanthropy, what it should focus on, because I know in some ways you've played both roles, so it'd be great to hear from you on that. So maybe um, we can, Maria, start with you around the need to listen differently. Any thoughts? Um, well, I absolutely think you need to listen to the on the ground. I think both Rohini and Tsitsi made points on this and the concept of empowerment. I mean, I come to the Rockefeller Foundation um, from the World Bank Group, and, and we did have offices in pretty much every market that we operated in. And, you know, it's, uh, it's an evolution for some of these institutions. I've seen the evolution in the World Bank, for example, which used to be much more Washington, D.C., headquartered and over time has become decentralized. And you know, um, the point that was made that um, uh, you wanna empower people to participate with you in your solution. And I think that is key because um, then, the, then the solution is owned and it's more likely to be sustainable. And I guess the other point that I'd like to make, and, and I will say it's one that I, I find that I'm, I, I'm coming in it into the philanthropy world from um, a slightly different career, but I feel like all of these strategic agendas and our focus areas, which which I think I, I agree with everything that was said today. I think these are all important areas to go. And I I would just encourage the philanthropic community to really focus on making sure implementation happens, that we actually execute on the ground. Um, we receive many things coming in and, and you can get it in a PowerPoint or a description and, and things sound, you know, there, there's many um, pretty aspirational goals. And we just need to make, make sure that we, we literally deliver day to day on the ground. So at the end of, of these projects that we indeed have delivered at least some way. I mean, th these are tough markets in some cases that we're trying and they're not easy tasks and we may need to pivot, but really focusing on, on, on the execution element uh, of, of this work, I think, um, I think, uh, think is good. And, and I think the, the, some, some of the developments that are now happening on, on, on measuring and, and sharing um, impact uh, will help that. Sorry, had to happen once that I'd talk on mute. Uh, thanks, Maria. Dennis, uh, did you want to uh, just talk about this potential silver lining? Is there one on education? I think it's always hard to talk about silver linings, but we covered a little bit the idea of, of uh, connectivity and, and digital education. So I want to focus on two other things very quickly here. One is, I think, I think we recognized during the pandemic in a very, very, very hard, concrete way, two things that has always been there, have always been there. One is the enormous inequality in our public education systems, right, or in our education systems. It seems like inequality was born during the pandemic. It's not the case, right? It's not going to go away when kids go back to schools. It's not only harder for a kid in a poorer family to study when their schools are closed and they don't have good internet connection. It's always harder, right? They need a better place to do their homework. Therefore, we need to shift the way we allocate funds in education. We need to send way more funds to the poor families, to the schools who are attending the neediest kids. And it seems obvious, but it's not happening, right? So I really hope that after we go back uh, to kind of the normal school, we bring technology with us. I think this can help a lot, but also that we bring the this, this you know, perception of inequality that is very real and we do something about it in the way of funds allocating at least. The second thing that I think became very evident during the pandemic is the learning crisis, right? The idea that kids are not really learning, like, you know, Lots of parents are looking at what their kids are doing and they're seeing they're falling behind 
or that you know it's super hard or that actually the classroom time is not that you know well used so all the things that need to be improved anyway but now we have families closer to their kids education for a lot of families education meant dropping their kid in the school and picking them up when they finish right mm. and they thought education was a school's problem and now they are feeling it's their problem as well a lot of families are more engaged uh, we measured teachers' value in society. Teachers' values went way up, right, uh, uh, during the pandemic. People are valuing their kids' teachers, and they're recognizing it's harder than they thought. So now I think we also need to channel this energy for when things go, quote, unquote, back to normal. How can we keep families more engaged with education? How can we accept the learning crisis, understand that leaving a kid sitting in a classroom for 12 years doesn't equal having an education that prepares them for life. There's a big gap there. And we have to recognize that and focus on what's, hap what's happening inside the classrooms. How can we ensure great learning? How can we support our teachers and train them in the proper way? How can we you know, really, really think about learning? And I think these are two uh, opportunities we get from this crisis. Thanks, Dennis. Super. And, and uh... Titi, I've not left, left you much time. So if, if you want to just quickly, maybe it's not even about corporate, but if you think about the different types of philanthropies out there, do you have a sense of what you see as a role of family philanthropies versus other types of philanthropies? Well, uh, I think for me, the most important thing is COVID proved we are all fragile. We all need each other. You can't say one side makes money, the other side spends money. And one mm -hmm. area where we can collaborate is let the people from the foundation serve on the boards of the companies on, in the private sector and vice versa. I think you're getting a lot of claps for that one. Uh, brilliant. What I heard today is that the, really the role of philanthropy is to ensure a better architecture. And we, we, yes, we, you know, it's important to train people, but philanthropy is not going to train all the people that need to be trained. The leaders are not going to come from philanthropies, but can they angle that training to be more focused on the biggest problems? Can we get the digital infrastructure that, again, philanthropies are never going to fund the actual full-on digital transformation that the world is going to go towards? But can philanthropy play the role of that architecture being more fair and equitable? So the kind of equilibriums we reach in education are better than what we have today. Uh, I think that's what I really heard out of today. And I think that's it's a fantastic message to take away. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing very passionately your thoughts and to everybody else for lending your voices, ears and minds to this event. And with that, I will close it out.